Brothers and sisters, Brother James Clancy. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, gee, you know, I, 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 I was in uh, Saskatoon last night talking to about 400 uh, Saskatchewans about, uh, you know, the struggles we're in and so on and so forth. And uh, I got up very early this morning and flew over to, uh, of course, flew into Winnipeg. And, you know, I thought, gee, you know, I've been on the road a lot this week, but it'll be really nice to come home to Manitoba because, you know, it's always pretty steady there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you for uh, uh, giving me uh, a few minutes to spend with you this afternoon and talk about some of the issues of the day. I want to begin, of course, by bringing greetings of solidarity from women and men like yourselves, from the other components from coast to coast across the country. I want to offer my congratulations to Michelle, uh, to Wally, to Steve, to Peter, and We'll see, won't we, shortly. The last, uh, the last member of the team that you're electing here today. You know, to be a trade unionist, to have the courage to stand up and run, you know, they've got my utmost respect. Don't they have your respect? You know, to have the courage to stand up and run? I think it's so important. You know, the unions are calling, isn't it, really, you know, when it gets in your blood. Hey, it's, it's a calling. It's not simply a job. I mean, you're talking about expressing yourself publicly and talking about your values and hanging those out and having people call, you know, talk about them and discuss with you and argue with you. I think it's a calling, and I think that people that have the courage to run uh, deserve our utmost respect. And when I was coming in here this morning uh, talking about callings and the union movement, I was thinking of Kathy Ducharme. Hey? Kathy Ducharme and Ken Hildall, you know, peop two people that I had so much respect for and love for, right? And coming to convention floors over the years and listening to Kathy and always working and always sort of trying to keep her eye on the prize and how do we move forward and so on. And then working with Ken in a different way because he was staff. You know, he represented the great staff that you have here in MGU, right? A guy that was elected but they then had that tough decision to, to, to make. Do I stay on the elected side of the House or do I become a staff member? And to your credit and to our benefit, Ken decided to become a staff person. He's one of the most capable staff that we've ever met, but he's really representative of the staff that you enjoy here at MGU, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> These are tough times, as you know, as I work across the country, um, we've got struggles that we're facing, you know, in BC as we speak here today. We've got community-based social services struggling for a contract uh, in Ontario. I just spent two days working in Ontario, three days this week working in Ontario following the resignation of the McGuinty as Premier and the proguing of the Parliament. And, uh, you know, in Ontario, boy, we're scrapping, holding on, teachers are under attack. Our members, all of our contracts are up for renewal, and we know that we're, uh, we're really in difficult times. Some of the speakers here this afternoon talked about Bill C C-377, the attack on labor rights that is being uh, the private members bill that we're dealing with in Ottawa. We've got uh, m uh, members of parliament talking about, you know, the, the, the right to work, or, or as my colleagues in the states call it, the right to work for less laws, you know, that they're trying to impose here. There's a real attack on working families uh, right across the country. Uh, there's a more direct attack on public services and public service workers. And, you know, following the recession of 2008 and 2009, you know, as we predicted at our convention, uh, our national, last national union convention, that it wouldn't be long following the recession of 2008-2009 where the corporate side, the big business side, and, and governments that are beholden to them, it wouldn't be too long before they'd turn their sights on public services and public service workers and say that they were the problem. You know, and that was the problem. That the solution 
to, these, to, the, to the crisis and the calamity of 2008 and 2009 was to be found in attacking public services and public service workers. And you know, as well as I do, that's precisely what's taken place. Eh? And, and it was so frustrating all of my adult life as a trade unionist as a, and as a public sector unionist to watch for the third time in 25 years another direct assault on public services and our members. And just so, you know, it reminded me, you know, as I see our components and our activists and as we struggle to hold on to not simply the working conditions and the wages that we've fought to build over 25 years for our membership, but also trying to hold on to the services that are so important to Canadians and which make a real difference in the lives of Canadians across this country. Here we are once again trying to hold on, trying to defend, trying to protect the very services that give people a shot at life, eh? A chance at life, important public services, services that define our country. It reminded me of us, you know, once again, we're, 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 we're fighting fires. We've got to fight fires again. We've got to try and hold on. We've got to mount campaigns. But at our convention in 2010, the delegates got together and we said, well, wait a second, let's stand back a bit. Let's just take one step back and ask ourselves, why is it that we find ourselves again trying to defend who we are, what we do, and why services are important to Canadians? You know, we're like the mice on the wheel, the hamsters on the wheel, you know, the ones that you bought for your child when he or she was six or seven or four or five. Or, you know, my kids, they always wanted hamsters, you know? And I feel like sometimes we're like hamsters on the wheel. We're running and running and running and running and running just to hold on to what we've got. How do we get off of that wheel? And so at our convention in 2010, the delegates adopted what we call our All Together Now campaign. And that campaign is based on an analysis that we believe gives not only ourselves hope and a way forward, but just as importantly is a plan and an analysis that as we get other Canadians to see it, to understand it, and to work with us, it offers us the hope of getting off that, that, that wheel that they've had us on for so many years every time we turn around, defending, 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 holding on, holding on. And the All Together Now analysis starts with a recognition that in this country, from 1945 to 1980, each and every year, the gap between those that have and those that don't got narrower and narrower and narrower. The gap between the have yachts and the have-nots got smaller and smaller and smaller. And from 1945 to 1980, you'll re you may not remember, I look at the faces, and some of you weren't there, <laughs> but your parents were, or indeed, in some cases, your grandparents were, yeah? You know, and what they recognized is that when we pool our common resources, our, when we pool our resources through a progressive tax system, and we spend that on the common good, we're capable of doing wonderful things. And they introduced things like Medicare, eh? the Canada Pension Plan. And they, they lifted overnight a million Canadians out of poverty when we adopted old age security. You know, public programs, publicly funded, publicly administered, publicly delivered, and from 1945 to 1980, that gap got smaller and smaller and smaller. And every year since 1980, the gap between those that have and those that don't has now gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And what are one of the characteristics that we find out of this period, 1980 to 2012? Well, we haven't introduced a new national program, have we? No? 
We're one of the last countries of the 30 richest nations in the world that doesn't have an early childhood education program. Now there's a good expenditure, if there ever was one. You know, this is long overdue. Aside from helping families get by and making a real difference in their lives, it's also a fantastic expenditure of public monies. For every dollar you spend on a national public child care, early childhood education program, studies have shown that you would it would return to the economy about $1.70. It's a good expenditure of money. But since 1980, as I said, the gap keeps growing and growing. We're not doing those programs. Now, some may say to you, well, that's because money's tight. Well, that's absolute bullshit. No, no, that's absolute nonsense. The size of the economy in, in Canada in 1980 was about $360 billion. Now, it's $1.6 trillion. And even after you factor into inflation, if the economy was this big, or the wealth of the nation, the wealth of the nation was this much in 1980, in 2012, it's twice as big as what it was in 1980. Amen. You know, don't tell me that there isn't enough money. There's a shitload of money, but it's in the wrong hands. No, no. Let me talk to you about three fundamental reasons why that gap keeps growing and growing since 1980 and why people are working harder, working longer. The first has been an unprecedented assault on labor rights. Since 1980, 201 pieces of legislation, 206 pieces of legislation, the latest figures as of last week, 206 pieces of labor legislation introduced either at the provincial level or at the federal level, labor laws. And of the 206, 199 have been takeaways. That is, they've diminished, eliminated, clipped, chopped labor rights. The ability of working men and women to come together and to organize into unions and to engage in collective bargaining. Now, there's a direct relationship between the, 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 the drop in union density 41.2% of workers were organized in the unions in 1982. That's now to, down to 31, and it's dropping. There's a direct link between the rate of unionization and income inequality. Because income unions, not, they don't simply bargain for their own members. By bargain, bargaining for their own members, they not only, of course, defend and help their own members, but as they bargain for their members, they democratize the economy. That is to say, all boats rise. The wealth is spread more fairly. It's distributed more equally or equitably through the whole community, through the whole country. So the first reason why, if we view income inequality as the canary in the coal mine, if I could put it that way, the first reason why it's risen so dramatically since 1980 has been this assault on trade unions. And what we say, and what we're working with groups, not only within our union, but outside our union, we're saying it's time for people to recognize that labor rights are human rights. Yeah? Now, the second reason why, again, we want to get off this wheel, you know, we, want, we don't want to be looking at 2016, 2018, 2020, back at the bargaining table, trying to hold on, right? The second reason why income inequality keeps rising is because in this country, we don't have an industrial strategy. Successful economies make stuff. You know what I mean? Successful economies just don't haul it out of the ground and take it off the mountainsides and just sell it off cheap 
and don't insist that something be manufactured and made here with it before it goes out. Three weeks ago, I'm working on the West Coast. 75 plants along the coast of the West Coast have been closed in the last five years. I was working with the paperwork, pulp and paper of the workers' union. 75 plants closed, and yet I'm standing and looking at, on a, at a port out there where there are logs as far as the eye can see. They're limbed, but the bark is still on, and they're being loaded into ships, and off they go, and we buy the stuff back. No job, 75 plants closed in the last five years. What about the much vaunted ring of fire next door in Ontario, where, we've, where we have discovered some of the most precious, valuable minerals in the world that exist in the world today? And what have we got out of that as they pull it out of the ground, load it onto hoppers and ship it out? We've got about 30 jobs in Sudbury, Ontario. And what about when we go to the East Coast, where I can take you to Bathurst and town after town, where we don't make pulp and paper anymore. And they're, 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 these towns and these mills and this has been shut down. No, 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 no. Successful economies make shit, make stuff. They make stuff, right? What do you say today to a niece or a nephew or a son or a daughter? who's 14 or 15 and they're 16, and they're coming up to you and saying, Uncle Bill, you know, Aunt Jane, Dad, Mom, what should I do when I grow up? What should I become? What do we say to them? What is the plan? What plan do we have in this country to build an industrial strategy so that we can look out 20, 25 years, 30 years, Successful economies do that. Successful economies do that. Successful economies don't allow an increase in poor jobs. Successful economies, countries don't stand by while increasingly the workforce is characterized by contingent work, part-time work, people that are working split shifts, people that are trying to piece together two or three jobs, people where in households today, every able-bodied person is out there trying to work. Successful economies don't build that way. They have an adult conversation about what we want to be 20, 25, 30 years, and I can tell you, successful economies don't allow people to come in and pull the resources off the hills, pull the resources off the ground, pull the resources out of the water and ship it overseas without doing any value added or doing stuff with this, the, the, the resources here before it goes anywhere, yeah? So in the absence of that, what you have are, is a McJob economy, what I call a McJob economy, and that feeds into increasing income inequality, and that's what's happening in this country. And the third area that I want to talk about is this notion of tax fairness. Taxes are important. Taxes are a progressive tax system, again, is we, we've decided over generations that we can accomplish more together than we can separately. And so generations of Canadians said, let's ha adopt a progressive tax system. And out of a progressive tax system, then we have the monies to pay for public services. Yeah? That's the way it works. And what's happened over the last 30 years? Time doesn't permit today to get into it. But what is, let me tell you the short version of this one, is that some people are not paying their fair share. And because they're not paying their fair share, other people who are in a much dip more difficult situation are paying more than they really should. Some people are shirking their civic responsibility and expecting everyone else to pick up the load. It's absolutely wrong. It's shameful. The study in July of this year that demonstrates that in offshore accounts, in tax havens, there's a trillion dollars Canadian sitting there. 
Yeah? A trillion dollars sitting there. Now, if that was taxed at a paltry 15% of a trillion dollars, that would be $150 billion. You know? And what would a national child care program cost us, which would put us finally in the ranks of the top 30 nations of the world, you know, one of the wealthiest nations of the world, we'd finally arrived there with a national child. What would that cost us? Nine billion, ten billion dollars. And these people are parking a trillion dollars offshore? Come on. Come on. And now we have a tax system where 90 percent of the taxes that are generated come from working people and 10 percent coming from corporations? Do you remember I talked about 45 to 1980 when income inequality was, was narrowing and we were introducing public services, national programs that benefit all Canadians. At that time, corporations were paying 90 percent and the individuals were paying 10 percent collectively. The, come on, this thing's really gotten screwed up. And why that's important to us, not simply as citizens, let me now put on my hat as public sector trade unionists. Why it's important to us as public sector union activists is because what they've been doing is taking money out of the kitty, the central kitty, that comes out of our pockets in the, in the form of taxes, and they've been taking that money and giving it over here to corporations in the form of tax breaks. And then they turn around and say, look it, there's no money in the, in the kitty. So you've got to tighten your belt. You've got to tighten your belt. You've got to work until you're 67 before you get old age security. And on and on and on. You see, this is a key issue, isn't it? As for public sector unionists. In our All Together Now campaign that we're running across this country, we're asking Canadians to join us in an adult conversation about taxes in this country. We're asking people to join us and let's have a discussion about how we fund public services. And when we start that discussion about funding public services, we surely have to ask this question and answer this question, who's paying what? Because I know what's going on. Some guy down here is paying too much taxes. Because there's some guy at the top of the hill that ain't paying, gosh darn, aren't, isn't paying enough, isn't paying any. So we need that kind of conversation. We need to engage people. We need to have a talk with people about taxation, progressive taxes, tax fairness. Because as I say, taxes leads to and provides public services. And the reason that's important, as I said earlier on, public services give people a shot at life. Yeah? Public education, Medicare, looking after those that are less fortunate than ourselves, social services, corrections, criminal justice, and so on and so forth. These are the services that really give people a chance in life. It doesn't guarantee the outcome, but it gives people a shot at life. Right? And public services is one of the key determinants in whether income inequality gets narrower or continues to grow. So the attack on labor rights, the lack of a clear, you know, modern industrial strategy, and the lack of tax fairness, which leads to the attack on public services and public employees, is those three elements that lead to and are the reason for growing in income inequality. And growing income inequality is not good for anyone. I don't care whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't do anybody any good. In history teaches us as, that as income inequality grows, what happens is the incidence of mental health, mental illness rises. As income inequality grows, infant mortality rises. As income inequality grows, morbidity, morbidity rates rise. As income inequality rises, there's more social unrest. 
as one group is pitted against another group. Does this sound familiar to you? Pitting one group against another group? You know, you know the trouble with public employees, public service workers, is that they're overpaid and underworked, yeah? Oh, no, 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 wait a second. Here's one for you. You know, the problem with public sector employees is they have a Cadillac for a pension plan, and you don't have any, eh? Yeah? You know what I mean? As income inequality rises, groups within our communities, within our province, within our country, are increasingly pitted one against the other. It's no way to, bring a, to build a country. It's no way you'd want to raise a family. That's not the way to do it. But that's what's happening. As income inequality rises, history teaches us that governments become more authoritarian. As income inequality rises, governments become more authoritarian. That's not the Canadian way. That's not Canadian values. Those aren't the values, the values, the values of love, the values of solidarity, the values of sharing, the values of caring. Those are the values behind the public services that we enjoy and that were built up over generations. And those are the values that underpin the kind of community, the kind of society we want. Those are the kind of values that are under attack. And I say, bullshit, enough of that. We're not going to take this continual denigration, running down, pitting one against the other. What we have to do, all together now, eh? all together now, we have to push back. We have to fight back. And I'm confident that we can. In fact, I'm really confident that we're doing it and we're gaining more and more people that understand our analysis, that understand who we are, that understand what we're fighting for. And I would surely encourage you to join with us. Could I have this, there was a slideshow here, but I, I, we've, I've dumped that, but I'm relying on Jeremy who's gonna show, uh, gonna help me through this. Jeremy, could I just go to, let me show you a, a very short, uh, let me go to slide two, if I could, Jeremy, or slide three. So all together now is the campaign. MGU's been playing a big role in it. We need them con to continue to do so. So the opposite of what I talked about just a minute ago is the common good approach. So what we're talking about is building respect for labor rights on the left-hand side. And we've established the Canadian Foundation for Labor Rights as a partner to work with us as we fight for recognition of the notion that labor rights are human rights. We want to drive union density up because we know that leads to more, uh, you know, less income inequality, right, and more equality. And then the modern industrial strategy, we've Canadian, created a group called Canadians for a Modern Industrial Strategy. We want to fight for good jobs in this country. There's no reason why, given our resources, the wealth that we have, not only in terms of resources, but also people, that we can't have an industrial strategy that results in good jobs, not contingent, part-time, endless service industry jobs. And so Canadians for Modern Industrial Strategy is a group that we've created and is working with us, doing a lot of the public outreach as we try and promote this, this, this uh, campaign and analysis. And then on the far side, tax fairness, we've created and are working with a group called Canadians for Tax Fairness and people that are fighting for a version of the Robin Hood tax here in this country. And in terms of quality public services, we've created the Public Services Foundation of Canada. Again, these are groups that we've created. They're populated with men and women from outside of our union ranks who, are, who understand what we're fighting for and why public services is important and the role it plays in, in our lives, in their lives. So Public Services Foundation of Canada. And then the underpinning to all of that is the All Together Now campaign, the campaign itself, and our Operation Maple site, which I encourage you to go to. Operation Maple is a new website, videos, uh, again, trying to put our story out in a more popular manner than perhaps, uh, perhaps has been done in the past. So I'd encourage you to follow those. 
And if I could, Jeremy, I'm going to take, we haven't shown this video publicly, but are all together champions for change and the activists across the country that have signed up and are working with us from all of our components across the country, including some great folks from MGU. Uh, this is a video that is a result of discussions that they've had as, as this campaign's been unfolding. I wonder if we could just show that video, short video. For 99% of us, there is a monster in the closet. It destroys jobs, it loots pensions, it puts families deeper into debt. It tears at the very fabric of society. The monster is called income inequality. Canada's real economic output today, as measured by inflation-adjusted GDP, is twice as big as it was in 1981. Over the last three decades, we've baked a much bigger economic pie. You'd think the majority of families would be better off financially today compared to 1980, but the opposite is true. The vast majority of families have gained nothing from decades of economic growth. The gains in income have gone disproportionately to the top 1% of income earners. The result is that Canada is now a much less equal society. The poor are getting poorer, the middle class is disappearing, and the ultra-rich are enjoying levels of wealth never before seen in Canada. Why should we care? Well, for one thing, income inequality undermines freedom and democracy. The unequal distribution of wealth leads to an imbalance of power, which undermines both individual freedoms and equal opportunity for all. We lose our sense of shared destiny and the solidarity which is essential to a functioning democracy. It also has very real social and health costs. It is in many cases quite literally a matter of life and death. Societies with higher income inequality tend to have lower life expectancies, higher infant mortality rates, more crime, more imprisonment, and more cases of mental illness and addiction. It causes social divisions by raising moral questions about basic fairness. Social tensions arise when an economic system creates a small and wealthy elite breeding cynicism amongst everyone else as people realize that the system is rigged against them. Rather than having a common purpose, we become a country of competing groups suspicious of each other. People lose hope, trust erodes, insecurity and fear flourish. Income inequality undermines economic performance. It's no coincidence that peaks of extreme inequality preceded both the Great Depression of the 1930s and the Great Recession of 2008. You can't build a strong and sustainable economy with a small and shrinking middle class, with more families living in poverty and lacking the financial ability to meet basic needs, or with household debt at record levels. How did we end up in this situation? Governments and corporations have attacked the rights of workers. Over the past 30 years, 197 of the 203 labor laws passed have either restricted, suspended, or eliminated labor rights. The result has been a race to the bottom regarding wages, benefits, and pensions. Governments and corporations have abandoned an active industrial strategy and instead embraced a hands-off approach to job creation and economic development through deregulation, exploitative trade deals, privatization, and corporate tax cuts. It's left Canada's economy drifting without a vision or a purpose. It's created an economy plagued by short dashes for growth followed by damaging recessions, industries which become soaring bubbles and then burst after a few years. It's meant the loss of hundreds of thousands of good manufacturing jobs. Governments and corporations have eliminated tax fairness. Tax cuts have mostly benefited the top 1% of income earners as well as wealthy corporations. The wealthiest Canadians now pay an effective tax rate that is lower than middle class earners and less than the bottom 10% as well. While middle and lower income families are paying more taxes, corporate tax rates in Canada have been reduced to the lowest of all the G8 countries. In addition to being unfair, these tax cuts have squeezed the public services we already have and made it more difficult to get the expanded services families need. Governments and corporations have attacked public services like health care, education, child care, employment insurance, and old age security. These services are the great equalizer. They make life more affordable for millions of families. But the share of total government revenue being spent on these services has been shrinking year after year. Families are left to spend more out of their own pockets for these services or go without the help they need. What can we do about it? We can fight for labor rights. 
Labor rights are human rights. We've got to be ready, willing, and able to stand up for workers' rights whenever they are threatened. Canadians who work hard and play by the rules deserve a chance to get ahead with decent wages, benefits, and pensions. We can fight for a modern industrial strategy, a strategy that will build a value-added economy which puts people, good jobs, and nature at the heart of our economy. A strategy that recognizes that labor, government, and business all have a role to play in building a strong and sustainable economy. We can fight for tax fairness and public services. Tax fairness means everyone pays their fair share, collecting more from those people and corporations who can afford to pay more, and closing loopholes which benefit only the ultra-rich. These changes would give us the revenue required to pay for all the public services we need. These changes would also renew the collective spirit in Canada, because taxes are how we assert ourselves collectively, how we assert our common values, pursue our collective aspirations, protect the common good, and shape our future together. Income inequality has taken us in the wrong direction, and we are more than 30 years down the path. But income inequality is not inevitable. It's preventable. It's all a matter of political choices. We must insist that our governments change direction and pursue policies that will tackle the income inequality monster. In the past, when Canadians faced big challenges, we found the collective will and purpose to find a solution. The time has come for a national discussion about this issue. Let's start the conversation. For more information and to take action, visit these websites. So we'll be calling on you in the months uh, that, as they unfold, right? Because they're working, there are men and women are, are in our components across the country that are really working hard on this analysis and we're equipping them the to, with the tools and so on. So I, I, I guess my ask of you is, is the following, that you give some consideration to jumping in on this campaign or you know somebody in your local, an activist or somebody that, that uh, comes to your attention and try and plug them in so that they can join with other women and men across the country that are trying to make, you know, trying to turn the corner on this. If we don't turn the corner on this over the next number of years, then we're back to just trying to hang on two years from now and three years from now and four years from now and watching our services slip away. So it's a fight not simply for our members, but really it's a fight for all Canadians. Yeah? Listen, all the best. I look forward to working with Michelle, the new team, and all of you in the forthcoming years. Thank you very much.